uh, we're delighted to have Charlie Gardner here, uh, who um, I think many of you will know for his um, extensive work in Madagascar. He was there for 10 years or so, in which he combined um, straightforward biological studies, uh, very interesting, with um, uh, social science and uh, working out what's effective and what doesn't. So real cutting edge stuff, really important work. Uh, since 2016, uh, he's been back at DICE at the University of Kent. We've got lots of friends down at DICE, um, a great research uh, institute, great conservation organization. He's continuing his interdisciplinary work. Uh, he mentions evidence-based conservation on his web page, so he must be really good. Um, he's been involved in activism, uh, including climate activism, Extinction Rebellion, and with Claire Wordley, who was with us for quite some time, who many of you will probably still remember, wrote a very influential piece, Scientists Must Act on Their Own Warning to Humanity, uh, which caused a lot of discussion, a um, uh, very important piece indeed, I think. Uh, he does a lot of climate work, and he's going to be talking about that today with his talk, Conservation in a Climate Emergency. Delighted to have you here, Charlie. Thanks, Bill. And if you've got um, questions afterwards, please put them in the chat or you can put your hand up at the end and we'll look forward to taking questions. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you very much, Bill. I'm excited to be here. I'm also really bad at speaking whilst doing techie stuff. So excuse me whilst I try and get my slideshow going. Right. Can you have you got my slideshow? Brilliant. Yes. OK. And um, so, yeah, thanks for that introduction, Bill. And thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm going to be brutally honest. I'm speaking to you from a position of terror. I'm terrified of what climate change means for biodiversity. I'm terrified of what climate change means for humanity. And I'm really, really worried by how conservation is not responding to the emergency we face. So what I'd like to do today is to persuade you that it is an emergency and um, so catalyze a conversation about how conservation should react in this emergency. Because at the moment we are just carrying on as normal. And that is one thing that you can't do in an emergency. So how do we react? Um, so we know the planet is warming extremely rapidly. These are the, the famous warming stripes each year. Each stripe represents a year and the color marks the departure from the baseline average. So reds are hotter years and obviously temperature is increasing globally um, yeah, very, very rapidly. So far, we've reached a global average of 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And already at just 1.1 degrees, we are seeing extraordinary impacts globally. So just last year, just in 2020, we saw the hottest day ever recorded on planet Earth. We saw um, in, in Arctic Siberia, it reached 38 degrees in June. It was hotter in Arctic Siberia than it has ever been in the UK. We've seen extraordinary wildfires across North and South America. 27 million acres were burnt in Russia last year. Australia, of course, famously. In China, four million people were displaced by floods. Another four million were displaced by flooding in India and Nepal. We saw the busiest ever Atlantic hurricane season. There were 30 named storms. They had to move on to the Greek alphabet because they ran out of letters. And we saw the strongest ever storm, Typhoon Goni, which made landfall in the Philippines. This had sustained wind speeds of 315 kilometers an hour, not gusts, sustained wind speeds of over 200 miles an hour. And that is at 1.1 degrees. We are heading for, uh, yeah, on average, probably four degrees um, average global temperature increase by the end of this century. These, these maps show, on the left-hand side, we see um, projected temperature increases under a low emission scenario. And on the right, we see uh, projected temperature increases on a high emission scenario. And there are two important things to note here. One is that when we talk about four degrees increase on average across the globe, that the, the changes are not evenly distributed. If we look at the 
Arctic, the North Pole, we are talking about 10 degrees of warming by the end of this century. The second key thing to note is that we are tracking the worst case scenario. So of course, all species must respond to climate changes and they do so primarily in one of two ways. The, the, the first thing you can do if climate is changing and the location where you, um, where you live is, is no longer you know, within your niche, then you move, you, you, you shift your distribution to keep track of the changing climate. This animation, um, I hope it's animated for you, it certainly is for me, this animation shows um, the expansion and retreat of ice caps across northern Europe from 30,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago. And of course, we can easily imagine whole communities and plants of plants and animals, you know, moving northwards and southwards in response to these changing conditions. Species move, species have always moved, it's not a problem. You know, if you look at Scotland, Scotland was under ice caps, under glaciers until 12,000 years ago. There were no species there whatsoever. Everything that is there now has moved there within the last 10,000 years. So what's the problem? Well, we now live in a highly fragmented world. We are forcing species to move whilst simultaneously preventing them from doing so. The second way that species respond to climate change is they shift in time. They change the seasonality of their life cycles. This, this is something we call phenological change. And the problem arises because all species are responding at different rates. Some of them might respond to different climatic cues or whatever. Um, and when species change their seasonality at different rates, interacting species, then those interactions break down. And this is something we call phenological mismatch. And we're seeing this everywhere. So, you know, there's a great tip outside my window now. Um, these will be breeding really soon, but the winter moths that whose caterpillars they rely on um, will have already finished by the time they start breeding. They, yeah, by the time the chicks attach, the main prey availability will be over. We see plants that are out of synchrony with their pollinators. Um, this is a bee orchid that is pollinated by the buffish mining bee, um, but you know, they're not in synchrony anymore, so they're not getting pollinated. Um, in some cases, this can have real you know, impacts right across ecosystems. So the Pacific Black Brant, which is a close relative of our Brent goose, um, is migrating earlier and earlier to the tundra. That means it's having much greater impacts on the sedge, which is grazes, and um, it's turning that ecosystem from a net carbon sink into a net carbon source. So phenological mismatch, really, really big problem. Our biggest concern is that if we have all these species being pushed beyond their niches, if that happens to the majority of species in any habitat at the same time, then we will suffer abrupt ecological disruption. There was this paper uh, published in Nature last year by Tresos and friends, which tried to um, estimate when we will see abrupt ecological disruption. On the left here, we see the main, um, the, the main part of this figure, and I'll just try and walk you through it very, very briefly. Uh, the, the axis on, on the left shows the percentage of species that will be pushed beyond their niche um, at various timescales. And we see that the great majority of species will all be pushed beyond their niche at the same time in the decade from 2069 to 2079. 67% of species will be pushed beyond their niche in that period. So we will have abrupt ecological disruption in that ecosystem in the Cayman Islands. On the right, are the data for other ecosystems, including the Coral Triangle and the Amazon Basin. What Tresos predicts is that we will see abrupt ecological disruption in the tri Coral Triangle, affecting 100% of species, and it will start in 2060. In the Amazon Basin, we will have abrupt ecological disruption affecting 100% of species, and that's going to start in 2048, within 30 years. So this is, this is big news. Of course, it's not just species that will be impacted. Some of our most important biomes are highly sensitive to, uh, to climatic conditions and may 
yeah, may disappear entirely. These include um, sea ice, obviously, and this isn't just a problem for, for polar bears and, and walruses. It's a problem for the entire marine food chain, uh, particularly in the Southern Oceans, because the krill, which um, supports the basis of, of, of the marine food chain, krill feeds on algae that grows on the bottom of sea ice. No sea ice, no krill, no fish, no whales, no penguins. Tropical forests, obviously, um, uh, to an extent, they create the conditions in which they can grow through evapotranspiration. Um, so they are particularly vulnerable to, to drying and fire. And then, and then famously, coral reefs also suffer from coral bleaching. So we're talking about you know, some of our richest, most important biomes globally um, yeah, have, have a good chance of essentially disappearing within our lifetimes. And that's just the direct impacts of climate change on biodiversity. There are also indirect impacts because, of course, the, the greatest threat to biodiversity now is, is human activities, and we will be responding in response to climate change. And, of course, that will impact biodiversity too. So to give you an example of that, this is... Um, a map showing shifting suitability for, for wine grapes around the world. We're used to seeing species distribution models um, used to predict how, how, how species of conservation concern will react to climate change. Well, agricultural species will react to climate change too. And just look at Europe here. Areas in red are places where grapes are currently grown, but where grapes will not be able to grow by 2050. Areas in blue show where grapes will grow in 2050, but don't now. So what you know, we're talking about the entire reorganization of the agricultural landscape of Europe within 30 years. This will have immense impacts um, on biodiversity. And of course, grapes are just one crop. Bio, you know, agricultural um, production is the greatest threat to biodiversity globally, and it is going to be entirely changing over the coming decades. We're also going to see um, big increases in human dependence on biodiversity in low-income, biodiversity-rich tropical countries. Um, and that's because when people have nothing else, they turn to biodiversity as their safety net. So if a farmer in Britain suffers from a devastating storm or drought, then she has a safety net. She has crop insurance and she has the welfare state. This government will give her cash. In Madagascar, there is no such safety net. And my research, still not published unfortunately, shows that you know, in the south of Madagascar, People's favorite li preferred livelihood is farming. Climate change is diminishing the viability of farming in two main ways. It's changing the predictability of the rainy season and it's increasing the, um, the prevalence of destructive storms which destroy crops. So people are giving up on farming. And when people abandon the farming livelihood, they essentially have four options. They can go to the forest to produce charcoal. They can move to the city. They can move to the hills to carry out shifting cultivation, or they can go to the ocean and become fishers. So of the four options for people suffering from um, you know, climate-driven livelihood failure, three of their four options depend on biodiversity. And we are going to be seeing this increasing around the world in, in low-income countries as by, as climate change disrupts farming. Right, excuse me in advance, but this is the scariest map you will ever see. The, perhaps the biggest indirect impact of climate change on biodiversity is through human migration. And of course, it's not just other species, species of conservation concern that have a niche that's affected by climate change. Humans have a niche as well. And our optimal niche is between 11 and 15 degrees um, of mean annual temperature. Above about 29 degrees, it's basically physiologically impossible for people to survive. And areas with a mean annual temperature of 29 degrees currently cover less than 1% of the Earth's land surface. And they are these areas in black here. 
by 2070, areas with a mean annual temperature exceeding 29 degrees will affect one third of the global population. These are the areas hatched in brown here. We're talking about the top half of South America, most of North Africa, the Horn of Africa, Arabian Peninsula, India, Southeast Asia, Northern Australia, these places are going to be uninhabitable by people extremely soon. You know, the, the big worry is the collapse of human civilization. And this is something that people are increasingly talking about um, you know, as a very serious concern. The main uh, driver of societal collapse will probably be uh, what we call multiple breadbasket failure. So agricultural failure in several of the world's or you know, two or more of the world's major breadbaskets simultaneously. And this is a big concern because all of human civilization has developed during the Holocene. And the Holocene, uh, which you know, goes back to the last 10, 12,000 years, is a period of remarkable climatic stability. It's because of the climatic stability that we were able to develop agriculture. And it was because of agriculture that we were able to um, you know, develop divisions of labor and civilization. There are you, you, you know, some, some, some quite serious people, including Jonathan Rockstrom from Stockholm Resilience Center and others, um, talk about it being difficult to imagine organized human society um, with a four degree temperature rise. And we're heading for four degree temperature rise this century. So what that means is that young people alive today may well see the collapse of civilization. And of course, I'm not talking about hypothetical young people. I'm talking about young people here in this room right now. I'm talking about you. So this is the situation we're in. It's a situation so serious that Bill Ripple um, and over 11,000 signatories um, published a paper in Bioscience last year saying clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. And we'll come back to this word emergency. We need to explore this word in greater detail. But first I'd like to, to, to yeah, make the case that this is not just a climate emergency. We are also facing an ecological emergency. We have not been able to slow habitat loss and degradation. We continue to see overfishing, overharvesting of wild animals and the illegal wildlife trade. We are seeing ecological disruptions and trophic cascades because of the, the um, disappearance of keystone species and, and, and species that offer top-down regulation. We are seeing increases in invasive alien species. We're seeing vast increases in pollution, plastic pollution, chemical pollution, and the systematic poisoning of our agricultural landscapes in industrialized countries. And of course, there is climate change and its equally evil twin ocean acidification. So as a result of this, we are seeing huge declines in the extent, quality and diversity of ecosystems. We're seeing declines in the richness, diversity and abundance of species. Declines in genetic diversity, declines in ecosystem services, declines in ecosystem resilience, declining human resilience, and declining planetary resilience. So to summarize what we've learned so far, climate change threatens essentially all of biodiversity. And climate change threatens human civilization. And we are in an emergency. An emergency is an urgent situation that requires us to stop what we are doing and act. If my neighbor's house over there was on fire, I would act in a different way to how I react normally when I go next door. I would not take the time to text them to check if they're in. I would not ring the doorbell. I would kick down the door and go in and do what needs to be done because it's an emergency. 
that's what emergency means. We need to stop what we're doing and we need to act urgently. So how has conservation reacted to the climate emergency? Well, pretty much it hasn't. We have carried on doing what we've always done. And conservation is climate blind. And I was struck by this quite forcefully last year when uh, this paper by Mark Ransovell and friends was published in Science. Um, this paper caused quite a stir. I'm sure many of you saw it and had strong feelings about it. And it, it was controversial because it proposed having a single metric to measure biodiversity loss. It said extinction rate is the only thing that counts. That's what we should measure. Um, and so obviously it caused a lot of a stir. Um, what struck me though was something that was hidden away within this paper and really didn't get much attention at all. And this was that the authors had an aspirational target to reduce the extinction rate of species to less than one per million by 2120. We're talking about a world in which there will be no coral reefs, no tropical forests and no polar ice caps, and yet some of the world's leading conservationists are talking about trying to have an extinction rate of zero. This is just, it's beyond nonsensical. Um, so I, I, I was sort of triggered by this paper to start doing a piece of research to try and quantify just how climate blind conservation is. And um, so I started going through the literature and I'm only part way through the, this work with a couple of students of mine. But um, having gone through all the papers published in the journal Biological Conservation in 2019, of those papers that we decided um, climate change is highly relevant to, 55% of them did not even mention climate change. So I'm not saying they didn't integrate climate change fully into their research, I'm saying they didn't even mention it, over half of the papers. So conservation is climate blind, and this is a real problem. Um, so as well as you know, being more aware of the issue, we also need to react to it. And I'm going to make two quite provocative proposals for you because we need to wake up from our slumber um, and we need to decide what conservation is going to do moving forward. And the first thing I think we need to do is we need to reframe our mission, which is currently centered on conserving biodiversity. The thing is, humans, human civilization cannot persist without functioning ecosystems because functioning ecosystems are essential in surviving climate change. They're essential in two ways. They're essential for mitigating climate change, in other words, minimizing the impacts of it, but they're essential also for adapting to climate change, surviving those impacts that are going to happen anyway. So, um, natural carbon sinks can absorb about a quarter of all our emissions. So you know, we cannot reach zero carbon without them. Most famously, we talk about tropical rainforests, but all sorts of you know, ecosystems from wetlands, natural grasslands, mangroves, and um, you know, fens and mires and, and peat bogs all store huge amounts of carbon. In fact, the top six inches of, um, of a peat bog in the UK can store as much carbon as a tropical rainforest. So of course, we need to conserve these ecosystems. We need to conserve the vegetation and we need to conserve the soil, but that is not enough because ecosystems are more than just the plants. They are whole communities of interacting plants and animals. And it turns out that animals are absolutely essential to the carbon sink potential of these natural carbon sinks. There are two particular groups of, of vertebrates at least, which, which are hugely important. The first is frugivores, which are particularly important in forest carbon sinks. And that's because the largest and most carbon dense trees tend to be dispersed by vertebrates. So in deformated forests where the frugivores have been, um, have disappeared, the, the largest, most carbon dense trees just don't regenerate so well. And instead they are replaced by wind dispersed trees, which tends to be you know, much lighter and, and grow faster. 
So even without a single tree being cut, the carbon storage potential of tropical forests can decline by up to 28% um, if the, the frugivorous animals disappear. Um, all the ecologists amongst us will also know that carnivores, predators are hugely important um, in controlling the populations of herbivores and that allows vegetation to grow. Without sea otters to control sea urchins, you get no kelp beds and kelp beds are a fantastic um, store of carbon. The same with, um, with wolves and their impact on the behaviour of elk and, and, and other deer, um, which, and you know, the reintroduction of wolves can increase the carbon storage potential of temperate forests by, by changing the behavior of herbivores. Um, so yeah, we tend to focus on frugivores and predators, but there are all sorts of different species which make a huge contribution to um, carbon sequestration. You know, these are nature's climate champions. Another example is of the great whales. Now, um, phytoplankton in the oceans absorb four times more carbon than the whole of the Amazon basin. But what restricts phytoplankton is certain rare um, nutrients, I think yeah, phosphates and maybe iron, things like that, which they get from whale shit. So whales fertilize phytoplankton. And it has been estimated that the restoration of great whale populations to the size they were before industrial whaling sequester 4% of global emissions. So, you know, these natural climate solutions are hugely important in our fight against climate change. Of course, um, nature will also help us adapt to the climate impacts that we will face. Natural defenses, um, such as your know, salt marshes in East Anglia or mangroves in tropical places, these are much more effective and cheaper um, in preventing floods and storm damage than artificial concrete defenses. We're going to need genetic diversity of, of foods and medicines. And of course, we've already seen how biodiversity acts as a safety net for those that, that, that you know, have no other option and lose everything as a result of climate related disasters. So I think it's, you know, we need to get a bit more serious here. It's time to get real about how we talk about conservation, how we market conservation to the rest of the world. We cannot address climate change without conservation. And if we do not address climate change, we will see the end of human civilization. So conservation is essential for human civilization. So why are we still talking about it as the altruistic quest to conserve other species? Yes, we love pandas, we love lemurs, but it is much more important than that. And we need to start talking about it in those terms. I, I firmly believe that it is because we market conservation as the altruistic quest to conserve other species that society doesn't care for conservation. It says it does, but it doesn't put its money where its mouth is. Um, and as a result, conservation is hugely underfunded. You know, conservation works. We know how to save species. We know how to manage protected areas. We know how to catch fish sustainably. The reason we are not doing these things is because we don't have sufficient money. The size of our response is completely mismatched to the size of the problem. And that's because society is not paying us to do our job. To give you an example of that, you know, our number one conservation strategy globally is the establishment and management of protected areas. This has been a huge success. 16% of the Earth's land surface is occupied by protected areas. Wow, big win, except that they are not adequately managed because they lack funding. Global spending on the entire global, you know, global protected area estate is estimated at $24 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually the size of the world um, beard grooming um, market. Yeah. The world cares as much for biodiversity as it does for snazzy, well-groomed beards. That's how much of an impression we've made on people. But what if we appealed to their rational self-interest instead? And yeah, I, I think we, we need really need to reframe conservation. We need to, yeah, if we're to have any hope of conserving global biodiversity, 
we need to move conservation from the very periphery of, of society's activities to the heart of all social and economic policy making. And if we're going to do that, we need to place human survival at the heart of conservation. This is what it's ultimately about. This is how to get through to people. Um, so I think we need a new paradigm. We need to shift from um, you know, trying to conserve biodiversity to trying to ensure that we maintain the planetary conditions in which humans and other biodiversity can thrive. We need a new paradigm, and I call it survival ecology. Now, survival ecology is more than just marketing or reframing conservation. It, it goes to the very heart of what conservation is about. And I think we, you know, it, it requires huge, great changes in, in our objectives and approach. So the objective of conservation now is to maximize species persistence in the short term. We want to maintain the diversity of life. So for survival ecology, the objective is to maintain the conditions for life, to promote biosphere adaptation and functioning in the long term, primarily through, you know, um, getting a handle on climate change. It requires a complete rethink of our approach and our philosophies. Conservation is reactive. Conservation tries to prevent change through conservation or to reverse change through restoration. But change is inevitable now. That's the one lesson of climate. We cannot prevent change. So we need to be proactive now. We need to accept the reality of climate-driven biotic change and shape the outcomes. We have to stop trying to conserve a world that will not exist and start trying to shape the world that will. If that's our approach, then our priorities change too. Rather than trying to prioritize the most threatened species and the places that currently harbor rich and endemic biodiversity, we need to prioritize the function, ecosystem function, and the maintenance of complex functional ecosystems and the places that permit the maintenance of ecological and evolutionary processes. Those places might not be where biodiversity is now. Um, of course, many of our, um, our, our tools and strategies will remain the same. We will still need to manage protected areas. We will still need to empower rural communities to you know, manage their natural resources sustainably. We will still need to restore ecosystems, but we will need to do much, much more than that too. Um, you know, things like assisted colonization, the, um, in, the, the facilitating novel ecosystems and facilitating adaptation and speciation. So that's, you know, how I think conservation needs to move. But we need to go beyond that as well, because we also need to catalyze transformational change in our societies and economies. We need to catalyze transformational change in the relationships between people and the planet we live on. And to do that, we need to examine our existing theories of change. And there are two sort of unspoken theories of change in conservation that I think are based on completely faulty assumptions and that we need to move beyond. So our first theory of change is that biodiversity loss can be stemmed by addressing the impacts of human activities rather than the drivers. In reality, we need both. You know, I think conservationists have always felt we're conservation, we deal with impacts. Um, addressing the drivers, that's for environmentalists, that's someone else. Well, you know, environmentalists aren't winning either, so, so we need to give them a hand here. We need to do both. The other big theory of change is in our role as scientists. We've, we've sort of had this unspoken assumption that if scientists generate information on the consequences of biodiversity loss, then our leaders will use it to do the right thing. They will make wise decisions. Unfortunately, this just isn't true. Our leaders, our governments do not respond to scientists. They respond to corporate lobbyists and they respond to public pressure. And of course, many of us are aware, of, yeah, we know this, which is why beyond our day jobs as conservation scientists and conservation practitioners, in our private lives, we also engage in other activities to try and, you know, address the drivers and, and, and stimulate the changes we need. So we spend time writing letters and 
we write, yeah, we, we send off petitions. And if things get really desperate, we march from A to B on a sanctioned march. But we have been doing these for decades and they have not worked. We are still losing the war and we're losing it very, very badly. So as evidence-based actors, as you know, people studying and working in, in, in Cambridge, the, the home of evidence-based conservation, we have to ask ourselves, are there other ways of catalyzing the transformative change we need if we are going to get out of this mess with a world we can still live in? Is there a more effective way to catalyze major social change other than writing papers and signing petitions? Well, it turns out there is, and that's nonviolent civil disobedience. So when we look back at the history of the 20th century, many of the great social changes in the 20th century were won through nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, the, the struggle for universal suffrage and votes for women, the struggle for independence from, from empire, the struggle for civil rights for people of color. These were struggles that were won through nonviolent civil disobedience. And many of the great heroes of the 20th century, people like Emmeline Pankhurst and Mohandas Gandhi and Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, they were reviled as dangerous dissenters at the time. They were hated for the trouble they were causing, but they won and they made progressive changes that we take for granted now. And we see them rightly as heroes. The sacrifices they made won freedoms for millions of people. Today, nonviolent civil disobedience is on the rise again. And this time it's fighting to, for a planet we can survive on. There are you know, two main um, strands to this environmental um, civil disobedience in the, in the UK. There's Extinction Rebellion, and then there's the Greta Thunberg inspired um, school strike movement and you know, the Fridays for Future movement. In America, there's a Sunrise movement. In Germany, there's Ender Galanda. But you know, the, the main ones are the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion. And I, I honestly believe that our greatest hope lies in these movements. I've, I've, I've been a conservationist since, at heart, since as long as I can remember. When I was you know, six years old, all I cared about was biodiversity. And I have never had as much hope for the future. I've never had any hope for the future until the rise of these movements. So this, um, so this is the second thing I think we need to do. Um, as conservationists, we need to, in the words of Extinction Rebellion slogan, we need to rebel for life. And this is what I've largely been doing for the last couple of years, is um, activism with Extinction Rebellion. I, um, I'm moving away from conservation research, I'm moving away from conservation practice. This is where I feel my energies are best spent. And um, the other thing I'm trying to do is persuade other scientists and particularly conservationists to join me. Um, Bill mentioned this paper that, that I wrote with Claire Wordley, who was once of this parish, um, that we published in 2019 in um, Nature, Ecology and Evolution, Evolution urging scientists to, to stop just warning humanity of how bad things are getting, but to actually act on our own warnings. And, and as Bill mentioned, the paper became a bit of a sensation. Within 10 days, it had um, become one of the top 900 most shared and most talked about papers online as yeah, since Altmetric began. Um, so that's the top 900 out of 15 and a half million papers. Clearly there were a lot of conservationists, a lot of scientists waiting for this to be said. Um, so, you, you know, I've, I've, I've urged you to join these movements, but what have they actually achieved? Is there any evidence for them actually being effective? Well, you yeah, know, of course, it's very difficult to attribute causality, but since the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion started, we have seen unparalleled 
um, coverage of environmental issues in the media, including a climate debate on, on national television before the general election. The environment has um, risen to become the third biggest concern for UK voters, above the economy, above crime, above immigration. Two thirds of local authorities have declared a climate emergency or climate and ecological emergency. The UK Parliament has declared a climate and ecological emergency. And the UK became the first major industrialized nation to enshrine a decarbonization target into law. So these things are impactful. And then just two days ago, this was the front page on Monday of the Daily Express. This is unheard of. This is, you know, this is, this is a huge thing for conservation. This is, well, WWF, RSPB and the Wildlife Trust on the front page of a right, major right wing newspaper. This didn't happen from nowhere. This happened because of activism. So why should conservationists rebel? Um, well, this banner on the left here, which was, which was um, attached to the boat, um, the, pink, the famous pink boat named after the murdered Honduran activist Berta Cáceres, um, this banner reminds us that Extinction Rebellion is not just a climate movement, it is a movement for climate and biodiversity. So why should conservationists join it? Well, having scientists part of or actively um, voicing their support for these movements lends them authority and legitimacy. Boris Johnson dismissed Extinction Rebellion as a bunch of mung bean eating crusties. I can't remember his exact words. But, you know, when you have people with doctor in front of their name, people listen to us. It adds legitimacy. It's also, you know, scientists have said it's an emergency. There are people in this room that were signatories, I'm, I'm certain of it, there were signatories of, on the Bill Ripple paper saying this is a climate emergency. Well, if you're talking the talk, you have to walk the walk. It's one of the reasons I think that the, the general public have not really um, fully understood the urgency of the situation is that scientists say it's an emergency, but don't act like it. If we just carry on with our daily lives, just carry on doing our research, carry on, you know, whatever, without you know, pretending that this isn't happening, that sends a very strong signal that this is nothing to worry about. Conversely, if we act, if we make sacrifices, that is, um, that is a very strong signal that, that you, you know, the situation is really as urgent as we are saying it is. Many people, scientists are worried that advocacy, adopting a position may reduce their credibility as scientists. But in fact, um, you, you know, ex experimental work shows that this is not the case. Um, and it's particularly not the case for conservationists. You know, yeah, some of us might think, oh, you know, it's not my job to adopt a position or, or to say what needs to be done. I'm just producing the science. Well, I have news for you. You are conservationists. You have always been advocates. Conservation is not a, um, a detached objective science. Conservation is a value-driven science. It's a normative science. We have always adopted a position that biodiversity is good and must be preserved. So taking to the streets is no change there. All it is is a change of tactics from advocacy to activism. There are huge personal rewards for getting involved. You will meet fantastic people and you will feel better about the, you, you know, ecological grief and climate anxiety that you know that will suffer for doing something. It will make you feel better. A big reason I feel is, yeah, you know, I feel we have a moral obligation to act and to support those who are acting. This is our doing. For decades, we have been telling the public to be really, really worried about biodiversity loss. And now they are so worried that they are taken to the streets. So we have a moral obligation to be there with them. And I think also we need, you know, strategically, we need to ensure that these movements retain a twin focus 
on the ecological and climate emergencies rather than just being climate movements. And that's because emergency responses to the climate crisis actually represent a big emerging um, threat for biodiversity. Um, and yeah, but biodiversity does not have equal visibility in these movements. This, um, yeah, yeah, this chart shows media coverage of climate change in brown and biodiversity in green. And you know, both these crises are as severe and important as each other, but biodiversity is being lost. It is completely in climate shadow. So, and that's partly because the bottom-up movements are focused on climate. But as I said, you know, emergency responses to climate are a huge threat to biodiversity moving forward. For example, afforestation. The world has gone tree planting crazy because it seems like the easiest and cheapest way to um, address climate change without having to actually reduce your fossil fuels. Um, so you know, governments like, like things like tree planting. On this map, the areas um, highlighted in orange are places that have been proposed as um, tree planting opportunities or forest restoration opportunities, but which are actually in non-forest biomes, in grassy biomes. Yeah. If conservationists are not careful, if conservationists don't make sure that this doesn't happen, people will, you know, governments will try to plant up non-forested areas under trees as a climate solution. Of course, it would be ridiculous to imagine that the Serengeti or the Masai Mara uh, um, you know, could be planted under eucalyptus as a climate solution. But there are people proposing this. Renewables infrastructure is another threat to biodiversity. Okay, okay you know, we, we know all about um, wind farms and, and birds, which is you know, a relatively minor issue and one that can be sorted quite easily. But this is going to be a, a big issue everywhere. You know, you know, just a couple of months ago, I found this headline in the LA Times, renewable energy corporations in the USA are trying to get endangered um, status of the Joshua trees removed because they want to cover the deserts in solar farms. And then bioenergy is a huge problem and is going to be a huge problem. This picture on the left here is Drax Power Station. This is the UK's largest power station, which is nearing the end of its transition from being coal-fired to using biomass. Okay, biomass sounds great. Where does this biomass come from? This picture on the right is an old growth swamp forest in South Carolina that is being clear cut to produce wood pellets for Drax power station. It's, it's beyond nonsensical that bioenergy is causing deforestation, but these are the sorts of things that will happen if conservationists don't engage with climate movements who are driving climate policy from the bottom up. We absolutely need to put biodiversity at the heart of climate policy. And this is something um, yeah, I wrote about in this paper that was published in Nature Communications last year. It, it's open access, so have a read of that. It's quite short. Um, oh, I think that's all I've actually um, got for you. So um, yeah, this, you know, to conclude, this is an emergency and we really, really need to act like it. Of course, the work we do is important. We need research, we need conservation practice, but it is not enough anymore. We need to add an additional string to our bow and we need to become activists, I'm convinced of it. So what can you do now? Um, Please support the climate and ecological emergency bill. I talked about the need for, for synergistic um, climate and ecological policy. Um, I, I, I've been working to help develop this um, piece of emergency legislation, which has been proposed. It's been submitted to parliament by Caroline Lucas MP. It has the support of over hundred MPs already. Please lobby your MP, talk to people about the climate and ecological emergency bill. Please join Extinction Rebellion. Um, if you don't join them, support them. Talk to people about why you support them. There is a group called Scientists for Extinction Rebellion. Um, you see us pictured on the right here. Um, we, um, you know, we, we exist to provide a scientific basis um, for the Extinction Rebellion movement and you know, to, to 
lend our vocal support to it as scientists. There is another um, slightly more hardcore group called Scientist Rebellion that engages in um, arrestable um, nonviolent civil disobedience. And we have a Global Scientist Rebellion next month, 25th to 28th March. There are um, a number of, of actions that um, are being undertaken globally. There are weekly um, you know, action briefings that we're holding. So please find um, Scientist Rebellion on Facebook or Twitter or, or wherever and, um, and join us. You know, we, we, we need, this is an emergency. The systems we live in are leading to the destruction of our planet and our existing modes of working are not sufficient to trigger the change we need. So we need to think of you know, other things we can do. And I don't think anyone's come up with a better option than nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, so thank you very much. Over, that's me. Brilliant, thank you, Charlie. That was great. As you can see from hands and things, but it's kind of doesn't work quite so well. Um, so Gosh, lots of hands. <laughs> indeed. Um, so thank you, that was great. So, uh, Bob Bowen, uh, why don't you appear and ask your question? I'll do it for you if you don't, but why do you... I think I've got it. Yep. Hi there. Thanks for, uh, for inviting me or letting me join. And I'm a journalist and I listened uh, closely and I'm, I'm just wondering, I've thought about this as, you know, for myself, what would you say to other professions who... I mean, you kind of included everybody in your call to action anyway, in general, society in general, but do, you know, let's say journalists or doctors have a particularly high obligation to, to act now, just to simplify the question. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think um, knowledge carries an obligation. So any, anybody that is clued up as to, to what is happening has a moral obligation to try and do something about it. And um, thank you, Emma, for, for the link. Um, you know, XR does have um, sort of professional groups. There is a doctors for, uh, an XR doctors group. There is an XR writers group. There is an XR farmers group. Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. That, that's a very important point. And I, I think journalists um, in particular have, um, if not a greater obligation, certainly a greater power to um, to achieve some impact here. Yeah, thank you. I've I've heard from one of my first conservation influences many many years ago that knowledge, you know, kind of confers a moral obligation to act, and I've always kind of kept that kind of close. So thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. More questions. Put your hands up or so uh, Vivek, go for it. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a science researcher from India. Uh, I'm working among uh, Aboriginal farmers in uh, a state called Odisha in the uh, uh, um, eastern part of uh, India where uh, their uh, farming system is uh, uh, remotely located and uh, most of them are resource poor farmers and uh, small and marginal landholders. So uh, how could I take this uh, extinction rebellion ideas and those things among people who have less uh, access to any uh, uh, literacy uh, um, uh, resources or any um, uh, sophisticated materials? Uh, how can I... Uh, take these ideas in a grounded way to make them uh, uh, understand the current scenario which is happening globally. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. In terms of um, introducing the idea of, of non-violent civil disobedience as, as a way of catalyzing change, I don't think you have to. It's um, from what I can see, um, half the farmers in India are already engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience against you know, legislative change that, that will um, 
promote industrial agriculture over small smallholders. Um, so I think you know Indian farmers have a lesson to teach Extinction Rebellion rather than the other way around. In terms of um, I'd like to come back to your question, if 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 if, yeah. if you may, Vivek. I, I think it's it's yeah. It's, it's what probably I'm asking is uh, involved than, than I think we have time for now. Yeah. Uh, Can we continue I think, this fight? Uh, I'm uh, sorry. Sure, sure. I'll leave it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. That sounds good. And then uh, finally, Evelyn, do you want to ask your question? You're yeah. still muted. Good. Yes, thank you. So I would like to know how can we encourage action in countries where there are high levels of corruption and scarce awareness about climate change? I think we have discussed this in the MPhil session where countries where activism is not really safe. <laughs> and how can we make information more accessible to non-English speaking countries? I feel like the information is like compressed in like in English literature and Everything is in English, but in countries, for example, in, in South America, is is uh, more difficult to to access information. Thank you. Yeah. The, the 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 communication issue is a is a huge huge problem, um, and it's I, I, as far as I I can see, it's it's been a big contributor in why scientists have you know failed to to catalyze the popular action we need. Um, yes, the information is all in English. Yes, half of it is hidden behind paywalls. But I think the communication problem is much deeper and bigger than, than that. Um, scientists have a communication problem. We don't know how to talk to people. You know, we spent, climate scientists have spent years talking about 1.5 and 415 parts per million and all these abstract figures which don't mean anything to anyone. Along comes one 16 year old girl who starts speaking in emotive language instead of technical language and suddenly people get it. So it's not, it's not just, um, I, I, and I think there are big lessons there. It's not just um, making information available. It's about speaking about, you know, speaking in ways that gets through to people um, and you, you know social psychologists are, are very clear about this it is not our rational brains that guide us it is our emotional brains um, and, and I think we need to do much much better at, um, at, in how we communicate um, and stop speaking in abstract terms speak about what it means for um, you know for the rest of the world. I'm sure I've said a few things that have been quite shocking to you today. And that's because I've said them in a way that is shocking rather than in a way that is technical. Um, as for how to promote nonviolent civil disobedience in, in you know, under regimes that have less respect for, for human rights, um, I think there, there are, Nonviolent civil bits disobedience relies on creativity. It's um, there, there, there is no end to the types of actions that can be engaged in. There's a wonderful list um, of yeah, 99 different forms of, of, of civil disobedience that I can send you that was developed by, by a man called Gene Sharp. Um, I think one of the things about civil disobedience is that it forces um, governments into what we call dilemma actions. Now, XR concentrate on getting people on, on, on getting people arrested because that's how the that's how you build public sympathy and how the how how the public turn against the government is when the, they see that the government is having to engage in unjust repression rather than changing, and that's where the power of these um, people volunteering to get arrested comes from. That's where the power of hunger strikes comes from. Um, so, you know, you know th th there are things that you can do other than get arrested. And I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll happily um, send you some stuff by email as well. 
Thanks very much, Charlie. That Sorry, was great. Excuse me, there's a lot of room downstairs. Sorry, my house has just got very loud. I apologize. No problem at all. Um, uh, lots more questions, which I, uh, people could stand around afterwards and ask, but um, I, I think let's end. The, um, uh, so thanks very much. I'd uh, just like to say something about the next talk in two weeks' time. Uh, what we did as an experiment is we asked the master's course to run the most interesting session that they could. And uh, what they came up with, I think, is looks really interesting. They've got a session on uh, voluntary resettlement of people from protected areas. And there's three talks. Uh, the first is on policy, so resettlement of people from protected areas in India by Bodhu Singh uh, Pindara. Uh, and then there's an example, voluntary relocation of people from Banja Tiger Reserve by D.V. Girish. And then a personal, someone's personal experiences of the impact on them Personal experience is the Voluntary Resettlement Programme by A.P. Shibu. And that whole issue, issue is being uh, moderated by Mirani. So uh, that, that sounds really interesting and exciting. So come along in two weeks time. So I'd like to thank Charlie very much. Uh, that was uh, compelling, that was important. Um, I wish you hadn't showed me that map of places where people can't live. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to sleep as well as a result of that. It's a very scary thing. A really powerful case. And um, there's lots of debate about independence and involvement and those sorts of things. And it's very interesting to hear this perspective on that. So thanks so much for coming along and thanks so much for that. I'd love to now invite you to go outside the lecture theatre and have crisps and wine and chat to everyone and then take you for dinner. Um, but I'm not. So, um, so I hope you have some crisps and wine at home or something like that. So many thanks indeed, Charlie. That was great. So, uh,